The story begins with Sansui striking down the enemy commander with an energy sword. The soldiers look at Sansui and exclaim in fear, you are the sword saint. The origin of this story is on an ordinary day in Japan. Sansui was crossing the street, absorbed in his phone, oblivious to the traffic signal. A truck hit Sansui. He only heard the screams of passers-by, his vision gradually darkened, and he couldn't move his body. When Sansui woke up, he was startled by the face of an old man with a white beard. Sansui looked at his body, remembering being hit by a truck. He panicked and looked at the old man, then was even more astonished to see a city beneath him. The old man asked Sansui to quiet down, then corrected him to address him properly as he was the lord. Sansui was dumbfounded for a moment before saying that his grandmother, while she was alive, had advised him not to trust anyone claiming to be the lord. The lord immediately remembered a granny who had called him a damn old man in a very bitter tone. Sansui realized that this tone could only belong to his grandmother and, slightly scared, asked the lord if he was being punished for doubting his existence. The lord denied Sansui's assumption and admitted that he had indeed killed him. The lord said that Sansui's name, Shirokuro Sansui, sounded outdated, and he hadn't expected it to belong to someone young like Sansui. Thinking the name belonged to an old person, he didn't think much before ending the life of the bearer of that name. After realizing his mistake in killing an innocent life, the Lord felt very bad about it. Sansui doubted the Lord's words, thinking his expression didn't match what he was saying. To compensate for this terrible mistake, the Lord asked Sansui if he wanted to go to another world, offering him powers to ensure he didn't end too soon there. Sansui, without much thought and with eyes shining brightly, immediately expressed his desire for power to become the strongest in that world. It's clear that Sansui is extremely passionate about strength, imagining a scenario where everyone is overwhelmed by his power. The Lord wrote a letter and handed it to Sansui, instructing him to give it to the first man he meets in the new world. This man would train Sansui to become the strongest as Sansui wished. Before Sansui could fully digest the Lord's words, he found himself dropped into a forest. Sansui walked endlessly, calling out, but received no response. Suddenly, from a young tree branch, a young man in a kinigashi appeared. He glanced at Sansui and agreed to show him the way to a human village. Remembering the Lord's words, Sansui hastily handed the letter to the young man. After reading it, the young man reluctantly nodded and accepted Sansui as his disciple. He introduced himself as Suiboku from the Suiboku school, a wise man. Suiboku warned Sansui that the lessons would be extremely tough, and for someone seemingly untalented like Sansui, it might take about 500 years of training. Sansui was completely shocked, not expecting such a long time to become the strongest. Sansui officially began training with Suiboku from that moment. The beginning was not as easy as Sansui thought, as he had to run desperately to keep up with Suiboku's pace. Upon reaching a wooden house, Suiboku handed Sansui a wooden sword to start training. Sansui's training was to practice sword swings from dawn until sunset. Sansui felt slightly disheartened at the thought of repeating the same motion every day. Suiboku reminded him to focus all his strength into the sword, assuring that persistence would eventually lead to the pinnacle of power. This marked the beginning of Sansui's 500-year training journey. After training with Suiboku, Sansui realized that becoming strong in this new world was extremely difficult and harsh. As soon as the sun rose, Sansui would start practicing. He slept early at night to regain strength for the next day's training. From early morning to dusk, Sansui dedicated his entire mind to the sword. In the first few days, he experienced extreme hunger, but over time, the hunger faded, and he stopped thinking about it. From what Suiboku told him, Sansui learned that wise men like his master did not need human food but lived on Kasumi. With no other choice, Sansui absorbed all the techniques Suiboku taught him. Day after day, Sansui relentlessly trained. Over time, his uniform became tattered, and he switched to wearing a kinigashi like Suiboku. Sansui was so engrossed in his training that he almost forgot the concept of time. In the blink of an eye, 500 years passed, yet Sansui didn't feel any closer to Suiboku. One day, while training in the forest, Sansui suddenly sensed something entering the woods. 
Suiboku felt it too, seeming like wolves attacking two vulnerable lives. Upon arriving, they found a pack of wolves had mauled a woman. Sansui rushed to save the newborn baby in the woman's arms, who was miraculously alive. Suiboku didn't sense Kensei from the girl, but felt magic within her. He believed she wouldn't become a sage, but would fit better growing up in human society. Suiboku assessed that Sansui had trained seriously enough over the years to be called the strongest and entrusted him with the noble task of raising the baby girl as a father. Sansui held the baby tenderly, ready to welcome this new life into his and start a new chapter. Carrying the baby, Sansui crossed the fields. The hungry child kept crying despite Sansui's efforts to soothe her. Ahead was a village where Sansui hoped to find milk, sensing the souls of children there. He accurately found a house where a woman was nursing her baby. Sansui claimed his wife had left, leaving behind a newborn crying for milk. The woman, sympathizing with Sansui's single father plight, agreed to nurse the baby. After feeding, the baby stopped crying. The woman suggested Sansui head to the capital for better opportunities, considering the lack of jobs around the village and his youth. After the baby had her fill, she stopped crying. The woman handed the baby back to Sansui and rushed inside to prepare a few things for their journey. Sansui, looking towards the direction the woman had pointed, and then around the village, felt everything was new and different. For 500 years, he had never left the forest. Sansui had no concept of humans and the society of this world, and he sighed. The baby in his arms suddenly burst into laughter dispelling all the negative thoughts surrounding Sansui. At the same time, the woman came out of the house, handing Sansui a bag of goat's milk. It was all she had to offer for his journey to the capital with the baby. Sansui profusely thanked her before departing, hoping to return one day to repay her kindness if she were still alive. Sansui moved swiftly, using the blinking step technique. As he passed a carriage, he felt someone chasing him from behind. A loud voice demanded he stop. Sansui immediately halted, still holding the baby. The person who had shouted appeared to be of noble birth. She accused Sansui, calling him a rude commoner for daring to jump onto the roof of her master's carriage. However, seeing Sansui with a child, she did not pursue the matter further, but insisted Sansui show sincere apology to her master inside the carriage. Sansui apologized, admitting his mistake of inadvertently disrupting others' travel. The girl in the carriage cautioned Sansui, then stepped out, surveying his shabby appearance and disheveled hair, deducing his life was quite unstable. She then offered Sansui a chance to come to her mansion, with the condition that if he passed a test, he would be given a job. Sansui immediately agreed, surprised by such an offer. The girl introduced herself as Dewey, a name Sansui had to remember well. Brower, the girl who had just pointed at Sansui, was about to express her disapproval when Dewey cut her off. Dewey was confident about her decision. Observing Sansui's hands, Dewey remarked they looked like they had wielded a sword for a lifetime. Indeed, 500 years was an immense period during which Sansui had tirelessly practiced swordsmanship. Dewey then turned to Brower, questioning her about the monkey, referring to Sansui, who lacked magical essence but managed to leap over the carriage roof. Dewey looked at Sansui with interest, thinking he might have used some rare sorcery. Sansui, not understanding what they were discussing, knew it was best to remain silent. Sansui recalled what Suiboku had once said. In this world, magic was common, but not everyone could use it. 99% of the population could use some form of magic, but the remaining 1% could not use any magic due to the absence of a magical essence, and thus couldn't cast spells. However, they could still produce similar effects to magic through rituals and ceremonies. Sansui's sage techniques were a similar form, and the rare sorcery that Dewey and Brower referred to was about techniques that didn't involve magic. Sansui then rode with Dewey to the capital, sitting outside with the baby, Brower disapproved of Sansui's excited demeanor, dismissing him as a clueless rustic. Dewey, however, was more interested in Sansui's potential usefulness. The carriage stopped at Dewey's mansion, where servants came out to greet her. Seeing Sansui, they were puzzled. Dewey kept calling Sansui the monkey and instructed the butler to arrange a room for Sansui and the baby. The baby in Sansui's arms started crying loudly, but a kind maid helped soothe her. Dewey's father and brother, both exuding the aura of experienced soldiers, welcomed her home. 
Dewey introduced Sansui as a rare magic user, wanting him as her escort. Her father and brother instantly drew their swords towards Sansui. Initially startled, Sansui reflexively responded with his sword due to his 500 years of training. Dewey's father was surprised and initiated a duel between his son and Sansui. Not wanting to break a promise to his daughter, he created this test to assess Sansui's abilities. The maid holding the baby asked Sansui the child's name, to which he replied Rain. The duel began, with Dewey's brother in armor and sword rushing forward. Sansui calmly used his energy sword and defeated his opponent with a single strike. Dewey's father was astonished that his son was defeated so quickly by a wooden sword, leaving him no choice but to engage personally. He aimed for Sansui's flank, seizing a moment of perceived vulnerability. However, Sansui reacted swiftly, turning around and jabbing his elbow into his opponent's chest, causing the man to roll away in agony. Dewey was quite pleased with this outcome, as it now left no reason for her father and brother to prevent Sansui from becoming her escort. The maid handed Rain over to Sansui's arms. The father and son shared a joyous, warm smile, creating a heartwarming scene. Sansui decided this would be where he raised Rain. Although his master's family was a bit eccentric, it wasn't a significant issue. At the moment, Sansui felt a bit worried, but he couldn't consider Dewey a good master either. When Sansui told Dewey that, a virtuous person cannot be burnt, she immediately attempted to burn Sansui. And when he said, a virtuous person cannot drown, Dewey actually had Brower try to drown Sansui to death. Sansui concluded that Dewey was a selfish person, a spoiled rich girl who got everything she wanted, but it must be said that with her status, Dewey was allowed to act as she pleased. Sansui learned that in the kingdom of Arcana, besides the royal family, there were four noble families with the most influence and land. Dewey, his young mistress, was the heiress of the Sopid family. Her father, the head of the family, followed by her brother, both loved Dewey dearly, which only fueled her selfishness. It's understandable for a pampered lady, used to getting everything she wants, to gradually form a habit and believe that she deserves everything. Despite knowing his mistress was not a very pleasant person, Sansui had no intention of leaving since Rain was still there. If he left, Rain would have nowhere to stay, nothing to eat, and they both would be destitute. The Sopid family was indeed generous, helping Sansui raise Rain like any other noble child. Rain had access to books, dressed cleanly and prettily. Dewey treated Rain well, willing to spend entire afternoons enjoying tea and cakes with her. Gradually, Sansui started to see Brower as a kind-hearted person. Brower, though young, was a prodigy in both swordsmanship and magic. Initially cold, Brower gradually opened up after working with Sansui, becoming a reliable teammate. And so, five years passed in the blink of an eye until one day, Sansui, Rain, and Brower escorted Dewey to the Royal Academy. On the way to the Academy, despite Sansui's warning about potential bandits hiding in the mountains, Dewey was not afraid. In fact, she found it quite exciting. She left home for the Academy simply because life there seemed utterly dreary, and she was determined not to let her future become boring. Rain asked Dewey if everyone would be safe. Dewey assured her confidently that they would be, thanks to the strength of Sansui and Brower. Seeing Dewey's combative spirit, Sansui broke into a sweat. He thought Rain should be more worried, not so nonchalantly carefree. While Sansui and Brower could control the situation, a bandit attack would be a serious problem. Brower, not fond of this, sighed in resignation, not wanting to go against her mistress's wishes. The carriage took a detour, heading towards the dangerous mountain path. Night fell quickly, and they soon reached the mountain road. Rain, looking outside, became frightened and clung to Sansui. Sensing the number of enemies, Sansui alerted Brower that it was time to act. Brower left Sansui to protect their master, herself going ahead to deal with all twenty bandits. The bandits emerged from the bushes, brandishing their weapons, ready to hunt. Sansui observed that the bandits seemed to be going through hard times, with worn, rusty equipment and gaunt appearances. Brower mocked the bandits as foolish brutes for daring to ambush the Sopid family. The bandits laughed loudly, recognizing the family crest on the carriage, indicating their noble status. Brower invoked the spell Wind Cutter, stunning her opponents. The bandits, not expecting Brower to be a sorceress, called for an immediate attack before she could cast more spells. Brower leaped high, 
and her masterful swordplay eliminated four bandits in seconds. The rest redirected their attack towards the carriage to take hostages. Sansui drew his energy sword and struck down a one-eyed bandit, rendering him motionless. The second bandit, attempting to flee, was caught by Sansui, who propelled a powerful energy burst, pinning him against a tree. Brower and Sansui then coordinated to eliminate the rest of the bandits, leaving none. The carriage continued towards the Royal Arcana Academy, the nation's premier educational institution. By the time the group arrived, it was morning. The Academy's principal, a powerful magician, personally welcomed Dewey. Dewey asked the principal whether she should address her as Master Sorceress or not. The principal smiled subtly, preferring to be called by her current title. Dewey and the principal enjoyed their banter-filled conversation, exchanging witty and slightly sarcastic remarks. The principal glanced at Sansui, impressively able to pronounce his full name, aware that Sansui practiced the art of the sage, a rare ability she had never seen or heard of before. She expressed her wish for Sansui to demonstrate his powers in front of the entire school. Dewey looked at Sansui, uncertain if he could perform his abilities like a show. Sansui felt a bit self-conscious. Despite 500 years of practice, he had only mastered four skills. Light speed, which reduces the weight of his body and anything he touches. Instant shift, allowing him to move instantly over a distance. Energy sword, enabling him to infuse energy into a sword, making it as hard as steel. The last skill, energy release, lets him shock or propel anything he touches. Sansui was slightly disheartened, considering the length of his training for just four basic skills. He thought Dewey knew well about his limitations, so she wouldn't agree to let him perform. Sensing Dewey's competitive nature, the principal mentioned that the Batrabal family also allows their escorts to showcase their skills. Dewey's eyes widened, she wouldn't allow anyone to outshine her, so she immediately agreed to let Sansui perform. The principal smiled satisfactorily. Following her guidance, the group moved to the Academy's arena. The Batrabal family heir, Hapines Batrabal, was there, a pretty face and about the same age as Dewey. Hapines greeted Dewey, to which Dewey snidely remarked that Hapines' presence was so bland that she couldn't even remember the last time they met. Sansui noticed, despite both girls being promising heirs to their families, of similar age, and equally beautiful, Hapines was friendly, whereas Dewey was haughty and arrogant. Sansui observed that the two girls with Hapines seemed to possess rare abilities, they exchanged brief greetings before leaving. The remaining person with Hapines was a Japanese guy, not only possessing rare abilities but also capable of using every sorcerer's power. Entering the arena, the principal introduced the upcoming performance of the four individuals with rare abilities to the entire student body. First was Princess Suni Meijin from the Meijin Kingdom, who possessed the ability to transform into a mystical beast, a rare power from a deceased sorcerer in the Meijin royal lineage. Next was Tizuga, a master of curse powers, her curse ability could alter the material she targeted. When she cast a spell on a sword, it immediately became as soft as a ribbon. Finally, the principal announced a competition between Sansui, the strongest swordsman of the country, and Hapines Batrabal's Japanese escort, Sega, about to begin. Dewey insisted Sansui must win and show the opponent the difference in their class. Hapines then called out Sega's name, cheering for him to win and strip the strongest title from the Sopat house. Sansui and Sega felt immense pressure. The principal introduced Sansui as the Sword Saint Prodigy, the best swordsman of the Arcana Kingdom. Sansui understood why he was given such a title. His face, even after 500 years, had not aged, still that of a young man. Sansui, feeling he still fell short of Suiboku, was somewhat embarrassed to be associated with the title Sword Saint. The principal added that Sansui could use a rare ability called the Art of the Sage. Hapines started to feel a bit anxious. Next, the principal introduced Sega as Hapines' fiancé, the future head of the Batrabal house. Moreover, both Sunny and Tizuga were also betrothed to Sega. Sansui was astonished to hear this. Sega possessed support abilities, considered essential in combat. As Sansui knew, a support sorcerer meant using healing and defense spells, curing team members' wounds. Besides, Sega could also create magical walls and armor. Indeed, Sega had formed armor for the mat. 
Sansui, armed with only a wooden energy sword, sensed only one power emanating from Sega. Sansui guessed that Sega's ability to use other skills was a secret, and he presented himself as a support sorcerer. Moreover, judging by Sega's stance and sword handling, Sansui assessed that his technique was rather poor. The armor on him was not as hard as it appeared to outsiders. The audience in the stands watched anxiously as Sansui and Sega faced off. Sansui suddenly sensed a change in Sega's abilities and demeanor compared to just a few minutes earlier. He suspected Sega might be able to read minds or, even more significantly, foresee the future. Not wanting to waste time pondering, Sansui made the first move. He used his instant shift technique to quickly close in on Sega and then struck down with his sword. Sega raised his steel sword to block, but Sansui, wielding his sword in one hand, summoned the energy release spell with the other, pushing Sega against the wall. Sega's armor shattered, and he was officially defeated by Sansui. Hapines, witnessing this from the stands, was immediately frightened. The principal announced the end of the match. Rain quickly left her seat and ran to Sansui's side. Sega, knocked unconscious by Sansui's attack, had to be carried on a stretcher to the medical room. After receiving care from the doctors, Sega regained consciousness. Remembering his defeat by Sansui, Sega felt deeply humiliated. Papines was certain Sansui had used trickery to injure Sega. She didn't want him to suffer any more injuries. Sega genuinely wished to defeat Sansui, even if it meant revealing his secrets and using other powers. In this world, except for special cases, each person could only possess one unique ability. These abilities are determined at birth and are unchangeable. Those belonging to the sorcerer class could wield elemental powers like fire, water, wind, earth. Brower exemplified this with her wind cutter technique. Those with wisdom could manipulate space, gravity, and life force, known as the art of the sage, as demonstrated by Sansui. Those with loyalty could transform their bodies into animals, like Sunny's shape-shifting ability. Tizuga represented those with a cursing nature, able to change the properties of objects with her curse power. Lastly, those with a holy nature could create armor, shields, and heal wounds, known as holy sorcery. Each ability was used differently. Regardless of their powers, except for extraordinarily talented individuals, elemental sorcerers, or rare ability users couldn't harness their powers without proper guidance. Sega, like Sansui, was from Japan and also accidentally slain by a deity. The deity apologized to Sega in the same way as to Sansui, by granting him special powers and sending him to the same world. Sega could use not only holy sorcery for support, but also all types of abilities. This was a blessing from the deity, but Sega was limited to only four different powers. These included fire magic, holy sorcery, shape shifting, and a mysterious ability recorded by many sorcerers as the power to foresee the future, known as divination. With time and practice, Sega could use the art of the sage, truly a cheat ability. Fearing attention from malevolent forces, Sega decided to pretend to only use magic. However, to master all four abilities, Sega needed to train diligently for many years. The scene shifts to a forest where Sansui and Sega are engaged in a minor skirmish. Despite using all his innate abilities, Sega is quickly overpowered by Sansui. Previously overconfident in his cheat abilities, Sega had immediately challenged Sansui after his defeat at the arena. In the recent duel, Sega had created armor, used magic, and amplified his strength with shape-shifting, but his overconfidence led to an embarrassing defeat. Sansui, following Sega's attack trajectory, directly hit the core, breaking the armor and defeating him instantly. Dewey, losing patience, scolded Sansui for forgetting to entertain her, implying his failure as an escort. She thought Sansui was younger than her. Sansui remained silent, not wanting to reveal the truth that he had lived for 500 years. Dewey then shifted to a personal topic, asking if Sansui had an ideal woman in mind. Sansui honestly said that through his training with his master, he had learned to overcome his own desires. Brower blushed, her mood sinking lower than ever, realizing that the concept of romance was completely foreign to Sansui. Siga, now awake, clenched his fists in anger. Time had flown quickly, it had been a month since Dewey enrolled in the academy. 
Initially, Sansui thought Dewey would quickly lose interest, but surprisingly, she was quite attentive to the principal's lectures. Today's lesson from the principal was about failure in the development of magic. Sansui thought the lesson would broaden Dewey's mind, but Dewey's reaction was to laugh heartily. Sansui also began to notice a change in his and Brower's professional relationship. Having known Brower since childhood, it was understandable that she would develop an interest in romance at this age. Dewey sensed something between Sansui and Brower and often teased them about it. Sansui and Brower of course did not dare to object, as it would create an uncomfortable situation. Back at Dewey's mansion near the academy, Brower met with Sansui privately. She apologized for being distracted from her escort duties, preoccupied with Sansui. Sansui reassured her, creating a relaxed atmosphere. Unbeknownst to them, Dewey and Rain had been watching for some time, intrigued by the emotional developments between Sansui and Brower. Suddenly, Sansui sensed Dewey's father and brother approaching the mansion with a significant force. Brower, observing from a lookout, wondered why their outfits suggested a purpose other than just visiting Dewey. It seemed Dewey had sent a provocative letter to the two men at home. Seeing the frightening demeanor of Dewey's brother, Rain immediately clung to Dewey in fear. Following Dewey's command, Sansui stepped forward to restrain the newcomers. With his energy sword, he struck Dewey's brother on the head, knocking him out instantly. This scene set the stage for the story, with Sansui using his wooden sword against his opponent, earning the title of Sword Saint from the soldiers. Dewey's father, as usual, lost control and charged at Sansui. Once again, Sansui swiftly subdued him, leaving the soldiers in awe. Sansui helped Dewey's father and brother onto horses and handed them over to the soldiers, having only rendered them temporarily unconscious. A young soldier stepped forward to apologize for the inconvenience, still prepared to lead the troop following Dewey's orders to the location mentioned in the letter. Meanwhile, in another carriage, Sega felt secure with a holy sword exax for upcoming battles. It turned out that Dewey's father and brother led an army to test how Sansui would react in emergency situations. They were only testing Sansui's worthiness as an escort for the family's beloved daughter. Reluctantly, Dewey's father had to admit that Sansui passed this unexpected test. Sansui knew the two were just pretending and chose to remain silent, listening. Suddenly, Dewey's father spoke up, throwing the letter onto the table and demanding an explanation for its content. The letter from Dewey stated that she and Sansui would marry, Brower would bear their children. Brower was left speechless. Dewey's brother suggested appointing Sansui to a more suitable position for marrying a noblewoman like Brower. Dewey's father was clearly against the idea of Sansui and his daughter. Dewey could ask for anything, but marrying Sansui was out of the question. Changing the subject, Dewey's father wanted to confirm if Hapines's fiancé Sega could indeed use all the abilities. Dewey affirmed that Sega could use holy sorcery, shape-shifting, and elemental powers. Sega was truly a threat. His possession of these abilities was also why the Batrable family chose to adopt him. The Sopid family, competitive by nature, was sure that having Sansui, the sword saint prodigy, and the country's strongest swordsman, would elevate their status. Sansui humbly responded that his abilities were still far behind his master Suiboku. Compared to Suiboku, Sansui considered himself an amateur. Dewey's father and brother were intrigued, wondering just how powerful Suiboku must be if Sansui, with his unmatched strength, still saw himself as an amateur. Dewey was equally surprised, unable to believe the significant power gap between Sansui and Suiboku. Dewey's father then inquired if Siga also possessed wisdom and could have learned the art of the sage. Sansui denied this. All the skills he used were basic, but it took him 500 years to learn them. It wouldn't be possible for Sega to copy them just by watching. As the conversation was about to shift back to Sansui and Brower, the Batrable family's carriage arrived at the mansion. Hapines stepped out first and bowed politely. Dewey ignored Hapines, considering her visit a challenge to some trivial competition. Hapines announced that Sega had been recognized as the master of the Holy Sword, so they would engage in a significant battle. Sega, having trained diligently for a month, was eager to defeat Sansui and make up for his previous two losses. Earlier, at the Batrable Mansion, Hapines, along with Sega, Sunny, and Tizuga, met with her father. She apologized for hastily revealing Sega's secret to Dewey. 
Her father also reprimanded Sega for his impatience, but suggested that if Sega aspired to be the strongest, he might be able to pull the holy sword. As he spoke, Hapines's father produced a carefully stored map from a small chest and handed it to Sega. The map would lead Sega to the location of the most powerful holy sword named Exax. The three girls were shocked to learn that the legendary holy sword truly existed in this land. Exax from the ancient Arcana Kingdom era was known to be wielded by a swordsman powerful enough to destroy an entire nation. Sega and the three girls immediately set out to find the holy sword. It took them nearly half a day to reach the cave where the sword was located. Sega was astounded by the magic of Exax when he saw it. Exax, a talking sword, did not expect anyone to seek it for its power. Despite Exax's firm refusal, Sega persisted, insisting he needed to defeat someone at any cost. Sega declared he was no ordinary person, blessed by the gods with unbeatable strength. Exax demanded proof of Sega's determination. Sega promptly split a rock blocking the cave's entrance with his sword, demonstrating his desire to possess Exax. Returning to the scene of the upcoming duel, Dewey's brother took the role of referee. Exax, now transformed from a sword into a young boy, stood beside Sega. As the match started, Exax ignited in flames, Sega created a layer of armor around his body, drew a fire sword from Exax, and summoned wolf magic for shape-shifting. Sega transformed into a large wolf in armor, wielding a fire sword. The combination of the Holy Sword Exax and Sega's superior offensive abilities significantly enhanced his defense and physical strength. Moreover, Sega's divination skills were also greatly improved, allowing him to anticipate upcoming events. Sega initiated the attack, charging forward with a destructive strike. However, Sansui's incredible speed allowed him to snatch the sword from Sega's hand, causing him to lose balance and fall. Transforming back to his human form from his beast shape, it became evident that Sega's defeat was due to insufficient training. This was seen as Sega's most disastrous match yet. Sega was defeated, exactly as Sansui had anticipated. Sega's divination skill could foresee events within his field of vision, but Sansui's unexpected move caught him off guard, leading to his dominance. The match ended anticlimactically. Hapines, Tizuga, and Sunny couldn't believe what they had just witnessed. Sega's swift defeat was unforeseen. Hapines was baffled as to how Sega, despite his diligent training, still lost to Sansui. Sunny, albeit reluctantly, had to accept the reality that Sansui was far beyond what Sega had imagined. Sansui's light speed not only lightened his body but also anything he touched. At that moment, Sansui made Sega lighter, causing his sword swing's momentum to turn against him, spinning him around due to inertia. This was the sole action Sansui needed to defeat Sega. Dewey's father, like everyone else, was in disbelief. The speed of Sansui was incomprehensible, and his ability to defeat an opponent with just a touch was astounding. There was a stunned silence around, with no one speaking. Exax, who had thought Sansui was hiding his strength, now realized that Sansui was far more powerful than imagined. Exax watched Sansui's retreating figure, recognizing a movement and style eerily familiar to only one person. Exax loudly asked if Sansui was a disciple of Suiboku. Surprised, Sansui turned to see Exax sitting collapsed on the ground, weeping. Exax recognized that Sansui's recent move was characteristic of Suiboku's disciple. It turned out Exax's previous master was Sansui's master. However, there was a puzzle. The history of the Arcana Kingdom was ancient, and no one from that time was believed to be alive. Exax dismissed the possibility of Sansui's master being a descendant of Suiboku, convinced that Suiboku still existed in this realm. In the past, Suiboku had embedded Exax, then in sword form, into a rock before leaving. Suiboku aspired to become the strongest without relying on anything. The atmosphere became heavy as Sansui realized that Suiboku might be the person Exax was referring to. During his training with Suiboku, Sansui had never heard his master mention Exax. Dewey questioned Sansui's true age, and he hesitantly revealed that he had been training for about 500 years. Back at the Sopid family's mansion, the subsequent conversation felt like an interrogation. Dewey expressed feeling betrayed because, during Sansui's time with her family, they knew nothing about such significant information. 
Dewey's father and brother understood Sansui hadn't intentionally deceived them, but the revelation was still shocking and hard to accept. Mr. Sopid simply wanted Sansui to clarify everything honestly, without the need for proof. Sansui cooperated calmly, explaining that he never intended to deceive the Sopid family and had no reason to hide any information. He recounted his origin from another world, being mistakenly killed by a deity, meeting Suiboku, and becoming his disciple. He described his 500 years of sword training and meeting Rain. Dewey's family found it hard to believe Sansui's story due to its implausibility. However, they chose to trust Sansui, not because of his narrative, but because of the strength he had shown over time. They also agreed with the nickname given to him by others, the Sword Saint Prodigy. Dewey felt it was unreasonable that Sansui only practiced swordsmanship for such a long time and learned just four basic skills. Sansui assured that everything he said was the truth. Now, everyone understood why being a sage and mastering the art of the sage was not something an ordinary person could achieve. Rain asked why Sansui had chosen her current name. Contrary to Rain's expectations, Sansui replied that he had randomly thought of it, with no deep meaning or reason behind it, leaving Rain feeling disappointed. Meanwhile, at the Batrable mansion, a serious conversation ensued. Hapines's father spoke first, noting that it was no surprise Sansui was so strong, having trained relentlessly for 500 years. Sunny mentioned that in the Kingdom of Majin, there are legends about sages who could lift entire mountains and control the clouds. Such tales seemed like mere fairy tales, but Exax confirmed they were indeed true. Exax recounted an instance where Suiboku lifted a colossal mountain and flung it into the sky. Not only that, Suiboku also had the power to control the weather at will. Siga felt quite embarrassed for boasting about a month of training to someone who had practiced for 500 years. Happenies wondered why Sansui was escorting Dewey. The room fell into an uneasy silence again. Exax asked Sega if he wished to challenge Sansui again. Tizuga immediately became agitated. She didn't want Sega to get hurt any further. Exax agreed with Tizuga's view, suggesting that if Sega could defeat Suiboku's disciple, he would need to train ten times harder than the time Sansui spent training. A few days after the battle, Rain, now an imposing figure, was lecturing Sansui. Somehow, Rain had discovered that she and Sansui were not blood related. When Rain learned the origin of her name, Rain, she was really angry at Sansui's response. Whenever she had the chance, Rain would bring up the past to criticize Sansui for being indifferent when naming her. Unable to argue back, Sansui had no choice but to bow deeply and apologize to his daughter. Today Happenies, along with others in the group, visited Dewey's mansion. Upon seeing Sansui again, Sega immediately admitted defeat. Happenies looked at Sega, struggling to accept his readiness to give up. Although Sega might not feel satisfied, Happenies couldn't do anything about it. Dewey complimented Sega for appearing more mature. Sega didn't argue and admitted that he had acted foolishly in the past, causing trouble for everyone. The reason behind Sega's challenges was his refusal to accept defeat. Sega vowed to use his powers only to protect others from now on. Sansui reminisced about their battle a few days ago. Sega tried to act tough, but Sansui came out unscathed. Sansui glanced at Exax, feeling that the sacred sword Sega found was the same one Suiboku had used before. Exax then voiced a doubt. He wondered why Suiboku's disciple Sansui was working for an ordinary person. Dewey showed some interest in Suiboku, a person with unrivaled strength. In Exax's tales, Suiboku was a man of ambition and pride. Numerous kingdoms were destroyed in attempts to confront Suiboku's wrath. People likened Suiboku to an erupting volcano. Exax added that Suiboku once turned a forest into barren land during his practice. Rain felt excited and even admired that Sansui was a disciple of such a powerful figure. Sansui, meanwhile, couldn't believe Suiboku did such crazy things in the past, but seeing Rain's excited face, he chose to remain silent. Everyone was engrossed in Exax's stories, unaware that a mysterious figure was eavesdropping on their conversation. Sansui wondered what Suiboku was doing at that moment. In the area where Suiboku resided, two grave robbers brazenly intruded, intending to assassinate him. 
As if reading the minds of the strangers, Suoboku revealed that the grave they sought was where, five years ago, a silver-haired woman with a newborn was attacked by wolves. The two men grew curious about what happened to the child. Suoboku mentioned that his disciple had taken care of the child in the human world. The men whispered something to each other and left. Suiboku too pondered what his disciple had been up to all this time. The scene shifts to the Royal Academy in the principal's office. Stendo, the first princess of Arcana, reports on the information gathered about Sansui. Stendo was the one who eavesdropped outside Dewey's mansion. However, all the information she had was virtually zero. Stendo couldn't find any clues about Sansui except for his name. Like others, after hearing about Sansui being a swordsman who lived for over 500 years, Stendo, though skeptical, was forced to believe it. The principal shifted the topic, admitting that Sega was also very strong, even if he couldn't match Sansui. Stendo suggested that with his current skill level, Sega could be the captain of the royal army. Pausing for a moment, Stendo added that the royal family couldn't lag behind, they needed to find someone exceptional, someone with strength and abilities like Sega. Moreover, this person should not only be a match for Sansui, but also capable of defeating the Thunder Sword. Back at Dewey's private mansion, after enduring Rain's wrath, Sansui was subjected to her philosophical lecture. Dewey had considered the possibility of Sansui being older than her, but in reality, Sansui was older by 500 years. Sansui bowed his head, apologizing for keeping this a secret. Dewey began to reconsider the situation between Sansui and Brower. She didn't want Brower to marry a 500-year-old man. After much thought, Dewey found the matter increasingly complicated and decided to put it aside temporarily. Speaking of marriage, Dewey also wished to find a suitable man, someone with an appropriate appearance and family background, someone who wouldn't embarrass her, and most importantly, someone strong enough to protect the Sopid family. Sansui remembered the two men of the Sopid house, thinking it would be hard for anyone to meet Dewey's requirements. A knock on the door interrupted his thoughts, a guard from the Caputo family delivered an urgent letter to Dewey. The letter was from Pallet, the daughter of the Caputo house. It mentioned that a powerful swordsman from another kingdom had arrived, challenging the strongest swordsman in Arcana, Sansui. At the end of the letter, Pallet said she would explain more in person and reminded Dewey to come with Sansui to the Caputo territory. Dewey suddenly inquired about the swordsman. The guard described him as coming from a wealthy, noble family and being very handsome. Dewey's eyes lit up. She immediately decided to travel to the Caputo lands. After half a day's journey, the group arrived in the bustling, modern streets of Caputo, where homeless people lay scattered along the road. Sansui then realized Dewey didn't have a fiancé. Usually, noble families arrange marriages for their children from a young age, but Dewey's father and brother would never allow her to be betrothed. It seemed that Dewey had never shown interest in anyone before. As the group approached the city center, they noticed a noisy crowd gathered. Sansui overheard that a foreign swordsman and a local noble were in a dispute. The swordsman's appearance was truly captivating. With bright features, a tall stature, and a deep, steady voice, Dewey was instantly enchanted. Sansui felt like the world revolved around this man. Pallet then appeared, the author of the letter inviting Dewey to Caputo. She recounted that a few days ago, Town, a foreigner, and Mr. Pat Nursi, a noble from the Domino Empire, had caused a commotion in the area. Both claimed to be right and wanted to sue each other. Sansui had heard of the Domino Empire, a neighboring country that had recently succeeded in a revolution overthrowing the old government. The entire royal family was captured, and the nobles of Arcana sought refuge in various places. The cause of the altercation remained unclear, but Dewey already assumed that the pitiful noble, Nursi, was at fault. Pallet suggested listening to both sides before making any judgment. Town spoke up, declaring he had nothing to fear but wouldn't let himself be wronged. Pausing, Town turned to Sansui and said if he wanted a direct answer, little saint swordsman Sansui would have to defeat him. Dewey reminded Sansui to be gentle and not injure Town. Pallet seemed to share Dewey's sentiment. Nursi thought Sansui would surely be torn apart by Town. If Sansui were defeated by Town, Dewey's death would surely result in Town's punishment and then Nursi could act without concern. Conversely, if Sansui were a skilled swordsman, then Town would surely die. 
Brower, observing from a distance, could feel the power emanating from town. She suddenly became worried for Sansui. Dewey, completely captivated by town, had already set her sights on him as her future fiancé. Town, being a foreigner, towered a full head taller than Sansui. Town unleashed his Dance of the Dark, seemingly splitting himself into two and attacking Sansui. Town moved swiftly, the force of his sword not to be underestimated. The clashing of their swords created ear-piercing sounds. Sansui struck at the original Town's copy, causing it to gradually fade. Town then used his Cloak of Darkness technique to create two more copies and charged again. Sansui remained calm, quickly defeating the two copies. The spectators cheered as if they were witnessing such an exciting duel for the first time. Dewey was intrigued by Town's cloning magic, a rare ability she had never seen before. Pallet's eyes were on Sansui, silently cheering for him. Sansui was strong, but his opponent Town was also formidable. Sansui realized Town was using numbers to overwhelm him. He guessed that with each clone Town created, the control improved. Even without the cloning skill, Sansui still regarded Town as a skilled swordsman, physically stronger than even Brower. Town felt exhilarated by Sansui's strength. He exclaimed in disbelief at the existence of a swordsman with such tremendous power. It was at this moment that Town finally unleashed his secret skill. Ending his statement, Town created six more clones and initiated his Dance of Death. Sansui assessed that with this technique, quick reflexes were key. Defeating one clone would only lead to another clone attacking simultaneously. An ordinary person would surely be defeated, but as an experienced combatant, Sansui moved with precise accuracy, charging towards Town. Anticipating Town's next move, Sansui was determined to take him down directly. Approaching Town, Sansui still held his sword, but a second later, he tossed it high, distracting Town. Seizing the moment, Sansui snatched Town's sword and held it to his throat. Town conceded defeat, admitting that Sansui had truly broadened his perspective. Brower guessed that during the battle, Sansui had read Town's attack patterns. Town acknowledged his mistake in underestimating Sansui. Just as Brower thought, Sansui had indeed predicted Town's moves. Now, Town happily agreed to resolve the dispute through the council. Nursi was dragged to the Holy Magistrate to settle the matter, despite his struggles. Dewey left Brower to look after Rain while she and Sansui went to the council. Reluctantly, Brower became a babysitter. While showing Rain around Caputo City, Brower heard numerous whispers and discussions from the locals about the duel between Sansui and Town. Young women were especially charmed by the attractive appearances of the two men. Rain asked Brower if Dewey would marry Town. Brower replied that it depended on the decision of their boss and young master. Rain, looking worried, then asked if there was any chance Brower could fall for Town. Caught off guard by the question, Brower stuttered, unsure of how to respond. In truth, Brower wasn't clear about her feelings, but she was certain that Sansui was the only one she wanted to marry. Rain, like a wise old lady, told Brower to be clear about her feelings with everyone. The two continued their walk before returning to the Manson Mansion. Later, Dewey, Sansui, Pallet, and Town returned as well. Seeing Sansui looking tired, Brower decided to postpone the conversation she wanted to have. At the council, Pallet requested the use of a cursed spell to turn liars into stone. Nursi had attempted to assault a girl, and Town intervened to stop him, leading to the altercation. Things escalated when Nursi provocatively pushed Town to draw his sword and teach him a lesson. Dewey couldn't help but find humor in recalling Nursi's failed resistance. Town admitted he had behaved childishly and caused a disturbance, feeling partly at fault. He declined Pallet's apology, feeling satisfied with using the curse magic to interrogate and make the evildoer confess. All four from Dewey's side thought Town's response was quite cool. Town also didn't forget to express his admiration for the saint swordsman Sansui. Suddenly, Town stood up and knelt before Sansui, expressing his wish to become Sansui's disciple. Dewey generously stated that Town could come to her villa after being accepted by Sansui. Town immediately agreed, introducing himself fully as Town Majin. A surprising coincidence was revealed Sunny was Town's biological sister. Town was shocked to learn his sister was engaged to another swordsman and was eager to meet her and understand the situation. Dewey envisioned a far-reaching scenario, 
unable to believe she might become related by marriage to Hapine. Pallet saw off the guests from Arcana. On the ride back townside, guessing Sunny was causing more trouble for the kingdom of Arcana. He felt uneasy about his mischievous sister. Dewey commented that if they were talking about trouble, Sega, Sunny's fiancé, was 10,000 times more troublesome. Sansui and Brower nodded without comment. Town expressed his surprise at discovering Sansui was a sage. In the Majin country, ancient legends spoke of sages, leading Town to realize that Sansui was one of them. Town seemed unable to fully express his joy and honor at being guided by Sansui, who had endured 500 years of arduous training. Sansui thought that he could hardly continue to refuse and would feel guilty if he didn't accept Town's request to become his disciple. However, Sansui wanted everyone to meet Suiboku to ask his master's permission first. Dewey wondered why Sansui couldn't go alone. Sansui explained that Suiboku had previously instructed him not to return to the forest until rain was grown up. Dewey agreed to meet Suiboku and suggested that they could also stop by Hapine's house to ask if Exax would guide them. Town felt as if he was bringing trouble to everyone. Dewey, who had a soft spot for handsome men like Town, smiled and said she was also interested in meeting Sansui's master. Brower suddenly stood up and implored Dewey to reconsider cancelling her and Sansui's engagement. Dewey wanted to confirm what Brower just said, turning to Sansui and suggesting he should inform Suoboku about their marriage. Sansui felt a bit awkward and wanted to discuss this matter after returning to the mansion. Half an hour later at the mansion villa, Town apologized to everyone for his sister's action. He also expressed his gratitude for the kind treatment he received from the people of Arcana, despite knowing his home country's royal family's tradition of maintaining bloodline purity. Sunny was directly reprimanded by Town, she hadn't expected her brother to find her there. Dewey changed the topic, wanting to ask Sega to borrow Exax's sword to guide them to Suoboku. Hapines and his father were surprised to learn that Sansui was still not proficient in his technique despite 500 years of practice. Exax transformed from a sword to human form in an instant. He agreed to lead everyone to Suoboku. Except for Hapines' father, everyone was eager to meet Suoboku and insisted on going along. Dewey decided they would set off the next morning. Sansui and Brower were extremely confused about how to approach the topic of marriage. After returning to Dewey's villa, Brower and Sansui met to talk, but it seemed to lead nowhere. Initially, neither of them could start the conversation, creating an extremely awkward atmosphere. Then, they both spoke at the same time. Brower worried she was being impertinent for interrupting Sansui. Her mind was in turmoil, she couldn't bluntly ask Sansui to marry her. Sansui was equally perplexed. After 500 years, this was the first time he faced such an ironic situation with a girl. Finally, Brower blurted out that she wanted Sansui to take responsibility for everything. Sansui was taken aback, not knowing what he was supposed to be responsible for. The next morning in front of everyone, Sansui announced that he and Brower had decided to get married. While everyone was still surprised, Dewey hurried them into the vehicle to go to Suiboku's place. After half a day's journey, the group finally reached the forest at the border of the Kingdom of Arcana. To show respect to their senior, Sansui, and the group chose to walk instead of using horse-drawn carriages. After walking for a while, Dewey grew a bit impatient, really wanting to know how much longer it would take to meet Suiboku. Suiboku appeared unexpectedly, startling the group. Seeing Suiboku after such a long time, Exax couldn't hold back his tears. He ran straight to Suiboku and hugged him tightly. Since being left by Suiboku on the rock in the cave, Exax had been constantly thinking about him, always remembering his former master. Although Exax previously described Suiboku as difficult and hard to tolerate, his heart overflowed with emotions upon seeing his old friend again. Suiboku didn't refuse Exax's embrace, comforting him like an older brother to a younger one. After listening to Sansui recount his life over the past five years since leaving the forest, Suiboku was also happy to hear that his student now had a family. Suiboku reminded Rain to pay respects at the grave of the silver-haired woman who had protected her as a child. Later, Suiboku turned to Sega and Sansui to discuss the meaning of being the strongest. Sega genuinely wanted to understand Suiboku's concept of a swordsman general. Suiboku responded that Sansui's approach and conduct were his ideal. 
After a while, Suiboku revealed that two strangers had come looking for rain. The group became suspicious of the motives of these unknown individuals. Dewey speculated that the strangers' search for rain might be related to the incident five years ago and could be connected to the Domino Empire. At the Caputo Mansion, Pallet had a confidential conversation with Stendo. Pallet disclosed that the leader of the Domino Empire had recently sent troops into the eastern territory of the Caputo family, demanding the surrender of Nursi and other nobles seeking refuge in Caputo. Stendo immediately realized this was just a pretext, as the Domino Empire had been planning to invade Caputo for some time. Pallet was well aware of this dirty plan but felt powerless. Stendo was puzzled why Caputo chose to resist alone instead of seeking help from other nobles or the royal family. Some leaders of the royal family possessed four of the eight sacred treasures, including Ungekayo, a relic capable of cloning any object. Pallet mentioned Sega and Sansui, who possess immense power capable of shattering any obstacles in their way. Stendo had also heard about Sansui, a person capable of wielding a thunder sword to defeat the entire royal army. Pallet mentioned that the Caputo family had the strongest mage, whose power could be said to be 50 times greater than other elite mages. His name was Kaiyub Shuzu, able to manipulate all elements and obliterate entire regions. Currently, Shuzu was with the Caputo family's head. Shuzu's imminent test of his power had everyone on edge. Confident, he valued protecting Caputo's city and would strive to his utmost. The head of the Caputo family could do nothing but trust him implicitly. Now, there was no one more elite than Shuzu to defeat the enemy. Minutes later, the rival army approached the city gates. Shuzu, known as the Caputo family's trump card, was responsible for annihilating the invading forces. As the family head finished speaking, Shuzu conjured a massive magical sphere in the sky. The enemy, relaxed at the prospect of seizing Caputo City, was instantly terrified by the magic orb. It grew larger, and as it neared the soldiers, they realized it was a fireball capable of incinerating an entire area. Shuzu immediately directed the fireball onto the enemy, burning them to ashes. The Caputo army was stunned, and even Shuzu was shocked by his own ability. The smoke from the fireball caught Nursi's attention. He desired to possess the mage who wielded such terrifying power to overthrow the Domino Empire. A guard then informed Nursi that they had found the last survivor of the royal family. Hapines and Dewey's father, along with Dewey's brother, had somehow learned of this and followed the group to the Arcana border. Upon dismounting, Dewey's brother aggressively confronted town, demanding to know who dared approach his sister. Apart from Sansui, the others were still in the forest, talking with Suiboku. As they emerged, a strange aura enveloped them. Hapines and Dewey were surprised to see their father and brother following them. Town noticed Dewey's brother and greeted him with a friendly smile, intending to shake hands. Suddenly, Dewey's brother changed his tone and drew his sword to attack Town. Sansui had to knock him with a stick to stop his reckless behavior. Hapine's father recounted that after Sansui's group left, the Caputo family contacted him. A new invading army from the Domino Empire had arrived, but they were repelled by a single wizard. The situation was far from over. Dewey's brother added that the Caputo family had a powerful wizard under their command, and it seemed the royal family was considering risky strategies due to their lack of military strength. It was likely that the royals would use this wizard and Sansui as trump cards to prevent war. Ever since Sansui wiped out the royal guards on the day Dewey's brother became the family head, the royal family had held a grudge against Sansui. Now the group had to immediately head to Caputo territory. The discussion about taking temporary disciples had to be paused to address this urgent matter. Town and Sunny, being foreigners, were a concern for Hapine's father, who didn't want them to be troubled. Both brothers insisted that people from Majin never run from war. Town, having inconvenienced Pallet, was now ready to help if her country was in danger. Dewey was utterly charmed by Town's nobility. Her thoughts were now completely occupied by Town. Sansui suggested that Town join them with Dewey. Town happily agreed, despite Dewey's brother's anger. Thus, the heads of the four great noble families and their trump cards or heroes gathered in Caputo. In Caputo's territory, at the national border, Shuzu, after repelling the invaders, sat in a daze where the fireball had landed. Pallet and her escort were also present. 
she was worried about Shuzu's mental state, having maintained the same sitting position since the battle ended. The head of the Caputo army was also deeply concerned about Shuzu's mood and sincerely wanted to support him. Shuzu, realizing Pallet had been beside him all along, greeted her with a smile. Pallet expressed her deep gratitude to Shuzu, acknowledging that without him, Caputo's city would have been overrun. The war was not entirely over yet. Pallet declared that the Caputo family would ensure its end, as it was their duty. Sansui's group continued their journey. Dewey was slightly upset not being able to ride in the same carriage as Town, her face showing clear disappointment. Dewey's brother, on the other hand, felt this arrangement was appropriate. He still didn't want his sister to pay too much attention to Town. The atmosphere in the carriage was stifling. Sansui broke the silence asking Dewey's brother if anyone had been searching for rain in the Sopid family's villa. Brower suspected that the person might be from the Domino Empire's noble refugees in Arcana. Rain felt uneasy and asked Sansui if everything was really alright. Sansui reassured her gently. Dewey's brother also spoke up. As the head of the Sopid house and ruler of its domain, his duty was to protect everyone, and he wouldn't hesitate to risk his life for the safety of his family and people. This was the first decent thing Dewey's brother had said from the beginning. Rain was genuinely moved and admired the coolness of the house head. Dewey also affirmed that she wouldn't let anyone harm Rain, not even a hair. Brower and Sansui refrained from commenting, knowing that beyond words, Dewey wouldn't do much. In the other carriage, Sega asked Town if he was seriously considering marrying Dewey. Town knew that everyone was hinting at Dewey's brother's aggressive attitude being problematic. Town understood it as a normal reaction of a brother wanting to protect his sister. Hapine's father wanted everyone to focus more on the upcoming war than personal issue. Sega thought it was unreasonable for the Arcana royalty to want to retaliate against the invading new domino. Hapine's father thought it would be foolish for them to ignore national interests just to strengthen the Arcana royalty. Batrable's intentions were clear. He wanted to restrain the war at all costs. The Kingdom of Arcana was established 300 years ago excluding long-lived individuals like Suoboku and Sansui. For others, Arcana had existed for a very long time. The country had four major noble houses, equal in power to the royal family. These four noble houses had provided military support to the royal family since the nation's founding. The two warrior families were Sopid and Batrable. The Caputo family was known for producing generations filled with compassion. Finally, the cursed merchant family Decia had made significant contributions to the royal family at the nation's founding. Each royal generation granted territories as large as their own. With these lands, they also bestowed a certain amount of power. Although it sounded good in theory, the reality was that the kingdom had five regions, and the royal family only managed one of them. In times of crisis, the five families united, but afterwards, the king could no longer control the country according to his wishes. Moreover, power isn't everything. The Sopid family openly defied the royal family by letting Sansui decimate the royal guards. Currently, Arcana has four heroic figures representing the four noble families, known as trump cards. Additionally, there are two of the eight divine weapons that the royal family cannot access. Just as the four noble families worry about the royal family's recklessness, the royal family fears the expanding power of the nobles. It's understandable that the royal family desires a trump card of their own. At the Caputo family mansion, Stendo and his father were having a confidential conversation. Stendo mentioned that they couldn't lay a finger on Fushi Ukayo, the leader of the new government who successfully overthrew the Domino Empire. The issue King Arcana wanted to address was how to acquire one of Ukayo's four divine weapons. Stendo wanted to use the upcoming war to achieve this, to seize one of the four divine weapons. Nursi arrived, seeking an audience with the King of Arcana at any cost as a treasonous noble. Additionally, Nursi wanted to discuss the Daughter of the Holy Sword. After being granted an audience, Nursi revealed that six years earlier, after the great former emperor of the Domino Empire died, a wet nurse had fled with a child of royal blood. Nursi's soldiers had been searching for the girl and found the tomb of the wet nurse. They also encountered Suiboku and learned that Suiboku's disciple was raising the child. Putting everything together, Rain was identified as the daughter of the former emperor. 
Nursi's plan was to use Rain's identity, alongside the magical power of the Caputo, to annihilate the rebels and revive the Domino Empire. The king decided to call a meeting with the four great noble families, which Nursi was also to attend. Going through the list, the Sopid family had Sansui as their trump card, the Batrabal family had Sega, the Caputo family had Shuzu, and the Dissia family also had someone, though their name was unknown. The four great noble families and their trump cards decided to gather for a chat before meeting with King Arcana. Sansui had a feeling that the trump cards of Caputo and Dissia might also be Japanese. At the Caputo family mansion, everyone had gathered in great numbers. Shuzu was more excited than ever, rushing to shake hands with Sega and then expressing his admiration to Sansui. Shuzu mentioned he was sad for not meeting Sansui during his last visit to Caputo, continuously shaking Sansui's hand while speaking. Dewey thought the boy seemed hyperactive. Pallet introduced Shuzu with some embarrassment as the Caputo family's trump card. Both Sega and Sansui found the Caputo family members to be friendly and kind-hearted. The atmosphere became livelier with the arrival of the Ducia family. Besides the family head, he brought a woman named Pandora and a man named Shun. Dewey's brother, representing the Sopid family, greeted Mr. Ba Ducia. Papine's father, representing the Batrable family, also praised Ducia as a great general. Since the arrival of the Ducia family, Sansui felt an odd energy from Pandora, but nothing from Shun. Both Shun and Pandora had mesmerizing appearances, with sharp features and impeccable demeanors. Exax, in his sword form behind Sega, suddenly transformed into a human. He was overjoyed to see Pandora, who was also one of the divine weapons capable of causing disaster through curses. Pandora burst into laughter upon learning that Sega was Exax's new master. She added insult to injury by asking Exax if he was abandoned by his previous master Suiboku. Exax was so furious that his face turned red, and he clenched his fists, wishing he could sew Pandora's mouth shut. After laughing, Pandora turned to Sansui, asking arrogantly if he was a disciple of Exax's monstrous former master. As Pandora was tall and Sansui shorter, she had to bend down to speak to him. Suddenly, she changed her tone, lamenting that Sansui was a nightmare, claiming one person like Suiboku was enough, and that another similar individual shouldn't exist. Shun appeared calmer than Pandora, seemingly embarrassed by his teammate's antic. At that moment Akril, the future head of the Dissia family, made an absurd entrance. She was completely naked. Everyone was speechless at the future family head's behavior. The king and the four great noble families gathered to discuss how to deal with Domino's new government. The king's first words were to praise the Caputo family for their exceptional fighting. Even though the enemy army was equipped with weapons and armor made from divine weapons, the Caputo family did not hesitate to battle them. The humble leader of Caputo region expressed that Caputo was merely fulfilling its assigned duty. Subsequently, the leader of Caputo voiced his opinion and represented the governing body of the Caputo territory. He believed that despite the war instigated by the new government of Domino, a larger nation, peace was the preferable path. More specifically, Caputo wished to pardon the nation that had infringed upon Arcana. The Caputo leader, displaying great humanity, mentioned that most of the enemy troops had been annihilated, leaving only a small number remaining. Mr. Batrable argued that since the enemy threatened Caputo's land and Caputo repelled them, respecting Caputo's opinion was appropriate. Although the invading army was completely destroyed and the national honor not severely damaged, there remained a concern troubling the king. The king summoned Nursi to the council room. Mr. Batrable and Dewey's elder brother were perplexed by the king's decision to allow a domino noble to attend. Nursi revealed astonishing information from his investigation related to the sacred sword Sansui and Rain's daughter. Nursi confirmed that Rain was the princess of the royal family of the Domino Empire. He continued, stating that with the power of Caputo's witches, it would be easy to annihilate the traitorous self-proclaimed new government of Domino and then elevate Rain as queen to rebuild Domino. The head of the Sopid family, Dewey's elder brother, found this laughable. He spat in Nursi's overconfident face, dismissing his absurd claims. Mr. Dissi Dissia believed the king was too credulous towards a false noble like Nursi. Then, Nursi boldly stated that using Arcana's resources and people to save another nation was akin to betraying their own citizens. 
The king had no such intention, he mentioned that the new leader of Domino Fushi Ukayo had imprisoned the old Domino royal family and one of the eight divine weapons he possessed was the demon blade Dasenslaif. This blade had the vexing ability to locate anyone sharing blood with the person whose blood it had tasted. If Rain truly was a descendant of the ancient Domino Emperor, Ukayo would not leave her be. The king was nearly decided to establish relations with the new Domino government to avoid future disasters. Nursi tried to say something else, but the king dismissed him. He could do nothing but leave in resentment. The divine weapons in Ukayo's possession are as follows. Unge Kayo, capable of replicating any man-made object. Vajra, granting its owner the power to control the weather. Exilier, which can alter fate to protect its owner from death. And lastly, Dasenslave, with the abilities as mentioned earlier. Now, all four major families and the royal house of Arcana must cooperate to protect the national interest. While the king and the family heads were discussing how to deal with the new government of Domino, Sansui and the others were enjoying coffee and chatting in front of Shuzu's house. Tizuga was puzzled as both Pallet and Shuzu were cursed. Shuzu explained that his magic once activated spontaneously, causing his house to explode multiple times. Essentially, Shuzu's magic activates unconsciously and can destroy buildings. To prevent Shuzu's magic from inadvertently exploding, Pallet and Caputo placed a curse on him. Pallet or Caputo as Shuzu's guardian ensures that he cannot use magic without permission, not limiting his talents. Shuzu chose to live on the outskirts of Caputo City, fearing that an accidental explosion could endanger lives in a densely populated area. Despite the instability, Shuzu wasn't troubled by it. Elsewhere, Dewey and Happiness were at odds. Dewey felt superior as Sega, the future leader of the Batrable, was learning from his guardian Sansui. Happiness was confident that one day Sega would surpass Sansui. Sansui noticed Rain's consistent silence. He knew his daughter was restless but pretended as if nothing was wrong. Then, Sansui started a class teaching Town and Sega directly. The first lesson was the swordsmanship that Sansui had learned from Suiboku. Pandora kept staring at Sansui, making cutting remarks. Her attitude was due to her hatred for Suiboku, who she despised for being too perfect, unbeatable and immortal. Akril looked beautiful but seemed slightly off in her thinking. She was completely indifferent to Shun's blunt words and still found him incredibly cool. Returning to Sansui's lesson, Sager realized he had no skills at all. Sansui candidly remarked that many of Sega's powers were not really necessary. Dewey, sitting outside, further demoralized Sega, making him feel he had no future. Nursi then visited Shuzu's house to meet Sansui. At a mansion in the territory of the new Domino State, Ukayo'u made a historic decision. He would fight to the end until the Emperor was completely defeated. Nursi, surveying the surroundings, found it interesting that everyone present had a unique status. This cunning old fox, though resentful of being turned away by the king and the clan leaders, thought he could still manipulate these young people. Nursi calculated that with just a little incentive, he could easily persuade them all, like taking candy from a baby. Sansui interrupted his thoughts. Nursi went straight to the point, announcing that Rain could become the next queen. Sansui immediately affirmed that Rain belonged to the Sopid family. Nursi continued to persuade Sansui that Rain becoming queen would ensure her a bright future. Dewey immediately twisted Nursi's words, suggesting that the old man implied Rain would have no future if she stayed with the Sopid. Nursi suppressed his anger, reminding himself that retaliating against Dewey would not be in his favor. After pausing for a moment, Nursi argued that nothing was better than becoming a queen. Moreover, unlike Arcana's parliamentary system, Domino had only one sole ruler. As queen, Rain would have her commands obeyed by the Empire. Shuzu asked why Nursi's country had collapsed, leaving him speechless. Pallet openly criticized him as a greedy fool, feeling sorry for the people who suffered the consequences of their ruler's action. Nursi still tried to salvage the situation by bringing up the so-called national interest to blindside Sansui's group. He reasoned that they would become the bearers of responsibility for Arcana's future. Akril joined in teasing Nursi, saying the Decia family would lend their entire army to him if he had the money to pay her. Nursi was so furious he almost lunged forward. 
Chun, from beginning to end, treated Nursi's words as mere background noise, even threatening to pack him up and throw him away. Enraged, Nursi left, refusing to be humiliated by these kids. Nursi was brewing a plan for revenge in his mind. According to Akril, Arcana had already decided to expel the traitors. What happened next would depend on Ukayawu's decision. Everything about Ukayawu remained a mystery. No one knew how powerful he was or whether he would kill Rain. In the inner city of Domino, people were abuzz with rumors about Domino's defeat by the Caputo house. A palpable sense of anxiety enveloped the city, as everyone feared for their safety. Meanwhile, Ukayo'u, the country's leader, gathered the highest authorities in the palace for a meeting. Before addressing the main issue, Ukayo'u demanded the army chief explain why they had suffered a disastrous defeat against Caputo. The commander, trembling, honestly replied that the Domino army faced a witch who could kill tens of thousands with just a blink, making it impossible to fight back. The commander earnestly begged Ukayo'u for a chance to redeem himself, as he was also a key player in the rebellion. Ukayo'u countered, asking how he would explain to the families of the soldiers who died in battle. Caught off guard by Ukayo'u's tough questioning, the commander was at a loss for words. Ukayo'u insisted he be held accountable for his failure. Ukayo'u's verdict was clear. The commander must face the soldiers' families directly, and his fate would be decided by them. Despite his desperate pleas, Ukayawu ordered the guards to imprison him. The other leaders in the room were immediately terrified. Ukayawu then addressed the main issue, questioning why Domino had to seek peace with Arcana after just one defeat. Ukayawu, unwilling to greet Arcana politely, ordered the leaders to formulate a clear plan until his return, as he would be absent for a while. He warned his subordinates that if he discovered any foul play upon his return, the perpetrators would be ruthlessly hunted down and eliminated. The remaining leaders were forced to achieve victory or face the end of their lives. Back in his study, Ukayo'u was greatly troubled as things were not going as he planned. Vajra and Dasenslaif suddenly started arguing, and Exlixer had to intervene to resolve the dispute. Ukayo'u was determined not to die until he had completed his goals. He vowed to eradicate the last trace of the former emperor from the world. Ukayo'u's carriage entered the territory of the Kaputo house. Before reaching the city, they passed a deep pit, a remnant of Shuzu's victory over the invading forces. From the observation deck, the king of Arcana believed that Ukayo'u would regret opposing Arcana upon seeing the pit. For the king, national interest always came first, and if there were any pests trying to undermine Arcana, they would no longer be shown leniency. If Ukayo'u wisely sought peace, the king would only demand compensation for the war expenses. However, the first priority was to end the senseless war. Ukayo'u was then led to the guest room in the Caputo mansion. Meanwhile, Nursi was executing a devious plan. He had his men follow Ukayo'u and watch the area around Shuzu's house, where Sansui's group was staying. Additionally, Nursi hired a pair of Mandy soldiers. His intention was to eliminate everyone but ensure Rain survived. Nursi sipped his wine, envisioning the scene where the mages and nobles with Sansui were all dead. Once Rain became the successor and the old Domino Empire was rebuilt, his status would be preserved after the war. Nursi refused to support the rebellion like Ukayo'u, considering it the dumbest mistake. One thing he was sure of was that the king and the four family heads would deeply regret not following his advice. Nursi secretly rejoiced, imagining the king and the four families bowing and begging him. Suddenly, Nursi remembered something and asked his subordinate about the heirs of the four families and who they were with. The subordinate replied that they were with Sansui and Pandora's owner. This was an unforeseen problem for Nursi. He thought for a moment and said that if Pandora's owner died, it would drag down hundreds with him. Nursi still considered Sansui just a kid despite his title as the Sword Saint. He also had someone investigate Shuzu, who couldn't use magic spells to escape, thus having a disadvantage in using his abilities. Nursi scripted another scenario, predicting the war wouldn't end until Ukayo'u's rebellion was quashed. Back at the Caputo Mansion's guest room, Nursi's soldiers, who were lying in wait outside, burst in intending to capture Ukayo'u. However, they underestimated Ukayo'u's abilities and were all defeated by him. 
Ukaiou used the divine replication weapon to defeat the assassin. Ungeikaiou, capable of replicating anything, allowed Ukaiou to create dozens of porcelain vases to bury the assassin. Ukaiou's divine weapons, in their material form, were discussing among themselves. Vajar suspected that Arcana had planted the assassins to kill Ukaiou. Dasenslaif believed they were from Domino. Exilier, oddly optimistic, found the assassination attempt interesting as it provided a chance for training. Two more assassins appeared, using wind-cutting magic to attack Ukaiou. This magic implied they were mages, putting Ukaiou at a disadvantage. More assassins emerged, surrounding Ukaiou on both sides. Ukaiou was in a precarious situation, struggling to escape the relentless assault of his enemies. Ukaiou had no magic of his own, relying solely on his divine weapon. As the assassin's blades neared Ukaiou's neck, a sharp object suddenly sliced through them. Three assassins on Ukaiou's left immediately perished. The perpetrator was a beastman in armor, wielding a large sword. Ukaiou's four divine weapons were astonished at someone wielding four powers simultaneously. The remaining two assassins rushed to capture Ukaiou before he could be protected. The beastman summoned a spatial separation spell around Ukaiou. As he finished speaking, a transparent glass box formed around Ukaiwu's location, securing him in an unbreakable protective space. The remaining assassins were shocked and clueless about how to capture Ukaiwu. The beastman leaped onto the glass box and then down to the assassins, slaying one with his sword. The other assassin attempted a surprise magic fire attack, but the beastman's quick reflexes allowed him to move behind and kill the assassin with his sword. After eliminating the enemy, the beastman reverted to his original form Sega. As night fell, the Mandy troops Nursi had ordered to attack Sansui's group approached Shuzu's house with torches. Dewey, Hapines, Akril and Sansui sat leisurely in front of the house, seemingly unfazed. Dewey ordered Sansui to behead all the Mandy daring to approach. Sansui now commenced his deadly task. In reality, Sansui had never killed anyone. He only used a wooden sword with the ability to temporarily paralyze his opponents. However, now he had to follow Dewey's orders to behead all the Mandy attackers. Sansui was in a dilemma. The torchbearer spotted Sansui, who immediately teleported in front of him, tripped him with his wooden sword, snatched the man's sword, and as the man fell, Sansui fatally struck, decapitating him with his own sword. Blood stained the blade and dripped onto the ground. Another attacker charged at Sansui. As before, Sansui moved at lightning speed, disorienting his opponent, then precisely struck with the original sword. Sansui lamented the fact that these people only used outdated weapons. The remaining Mandy shouted to their teammates to attack Sansui before he could grab another sword. Sansui teleported again, miraculously weaving through the crowd to a torchbearer at the back, snatching his sword and executing another lethal blow. Sansui was truly following Dewey's orders, decapitating all the Mandy attackers. A scene of death engulfed the area. Hapines was in shock, having never witnessed such a gruesome sight before. In contrast, Akril seemed composed, even intrigued. Akril noticed that Sansui didn't use strength or magic, but simply utilized the sword's weight and precisely targeted the vulnerable spots on the neck. She had observed Sansui's movements closely, even noticing when he checked his own neck's vulnerable spot while executing a move. Hapines was not only afraid of Sansui but also of the girl standing next to her. Dewey was proud to have such a strong swordsman by her side. Hapines was puzzled why someone like Sansui would let Dewey arrogantly command him. Dewey explained that the Sopid family was protecting Rain. An unwritten rule was that a lord protected the family of their retainer, thus earning their loyalty. As for the Decia family, they had Shun as their trump card. Akril also ordered Shun to protect Rain, promising death by Shun's hand to anyone who dared harm Rain. Other assassins, seeing the battle at Shuzu's house, were moving towards the location but were stopped by Shun. Shun flashed a mesmerizing smile, masking a deadly intent beneath. Pandora appeared beside Shun, doubling the fear of their enemies. The assassins were so terrified they nearly wet themselves, believing Shun and Pandora were near Shuzu's house. Impatient, one of them lunged forward, sword in hand towards Shun. His blade grazed Shun, tearing the glossy night-colored vest, inadvertently revealing Shun's well-toned abs, which caught Pandora's fascinated gaze. 
The assassin was speechless with fear, not expecting Shun to be the perfect match for Pandora. Shun, already knowing their motive, questioned them about their intention to capture Rain. The assassins, trembling and clumsy to the point of dropping their weapons, were mocked by Shun as mere dirty players, unable to even seek rewards from their nation despite their loyalty. Upon Shun's cue, Pandora merged into him, transforming into a colossal shadowy figure. Shun challenged the enemies to kill him if they wanted to reclaim their nation. Meanwhile, Sansui was nearly done defeating the Mandy, with only four or five remaining. Standing amidst a scene strewn with severed heads, his sword still dripping with blood, Sansui presented a terrifying sight. The remaining Mandy, looking at Hapines and Akril, shifted their focus to capture the two girls as hostages. Sansui teleported in front of the girls, blocking their path. One Mandy, overcome with fear, dropped his weapon and fled. Sansui, not allowing any escape, swiftly appeared beside the fleeing man, swiftly decapitating him. Now only four Mandy remained, who threw down their weapons, surrendering and pleading for mercy. Sansui coldly declared that surrender would not spare them from death. Another begged at Sansui's feet, claiming he did it for money and family, to which Sansui retorted that he too had a family, before ending the man's life. Dewey approached, commending Sansui for following orders, but criticizing his slow execution. Sansui sincerely apologized. Akril commended Sansui's swordsmanship, worthy of the title of the strongest swordsman in Arcana, noting the beauty of his cuts. Subsequently, Sansui proceeded to eliminate the remaining vermin. Inside Shuzu's house, apart from himself, were Palette and Tizuga, vigilantly guarding Rain, who was deeply asleep. Shun and Pandora, after annihilating the assassins at the villa, returned to Shuzu's residence. Shun revealed that during the battle, he sensed the assassins carried poison to kill him, but their efforts were futile. Pandora and Akril clung to Shun, completely captivated by him. Shun, feeling helpless against these two young women, wished someone could make them disappear. Although everything was resolved, Sega had not yet returned. Hapines was certain that Sega had efficiently handled everything. Dewey felt grateful for having such competent teammates. In the backyard of the Caputo mansion, the Majin brothers were battling the assassin. Sunny, transformed into a beast, used her sharp claws to slash at those daring to attack her. Town, with his cloning ability, quickly eliminated the enemies in moments. On the rooftop, two assassins realized they were trapped. With their comrades nearly wiped out by the Majin brothers, they had no choice but to flee. But before they could escape, Brower swiftly dispatched them with a swift sword strike. Town praised Brower, equating his skills to those of Sansui. Sega joined Town and Brower, disappointed for not being able to kill all the assassins himself. Recalling Dewey's words, Sega felt he wasn't strong enough. Town rubbed salt in Sega's wounds, pointing out his past failures. The first time, Sega blamed his lack of effort. The second, he complained about inadequate weapons, and only the third time did he admit his failure. Town affirmed that Dewey's criticism of Sega was justified, but he also acknowledged Sega's strengths. Sega had fulfilled his mission and secured the country's future, leaving no reason for self-loathing. Sunny and Brower agreed with Town, both admiring Sega's performance that night. The future leaders of the nation had completed their tasks. Now they just needed to trust the king and the tribal elders. Later, Nursi was captured by the royal Arcana army. The next morning, Sansui and the heirs of the four clans, along with the town siblings from the Majin country, were summoned before the king. Nursi, bound and forced to kneel, was reprimanded by the king for his futile attempt to assassinate Ukayou at the Caputo mansion. Nursi protested his innocence, denying involvement in the assassination plot. The king, with a contemptuous smirk, revealed that he had cleverly collaborated with the four clan leaders to trap Nursi, who was now exposed like a filthy rat, his crimes laid bare for all to see. To atone for the assassination attempt, the king proposed to extradite the nobles who had fled the kingdom and distribute their wealth. The king was keen to hear Ukaiowu's opinion in light of the evidence demonstrating Arcana's loyalty. Ukaiowu expressed gratitude for the king's offer but sought clarification on how Arcana stood to benefit from the situation. The king revealed that it was a test of Ukaiowu's character. The four clan leaders smiled and nodded in agreement. The king remarked that Ukaiowu, unlike Nursi, was not wicked or despicable, and could be trusted with proper governance. 
If Mukayo had readily accepted the offer without question, he would have fallen into the same trap as Arcana. The king knew Ukayo could imagine what would happen. If the new leader of Domino accepted Arcana's help, they would be indebted to Arcana and fall under their governance. Ukayo then questioned whether accepting Arcana's aid would make the new leader of Domino a vassal state. The king brought up an important condition, a one-sided concession. He revealed that a young girl under Arcana's protection was rumored to be of the previous Domino Emperor's bloodline. If Arcana did not receive assistance from Ukayo's sacred treasury, they wanted Ukayo to abandon the pursuit of the girl. Ukayo warned that Arcana might end up mired in a quagmire. The king responded that if it were only a minor quagmire, Arcana's demand would be a trivial price. In the end, Ukayo knelt, surrendering the sacred treasury to the king of Arcana and seeking mercy for the people of the new leader of Domino. Thus, from that point on, Arcana and the new leader of Domino could walk a joint path. King Arcana and the new leader of Domino have officially teamed up. From now on, rain will no longer be a concern for the people. To expedite matters, the king decides to send his daughter, Princess Stendo, to Ukayo as a representative of Arcana. The king also hopes that Ukayo will always treat Stendo well. Ukayo, with great politeness, extends his hand to shake Stendo's, symbolizing the friendship between the two nations. Akril has foreseen the royal family's future strategy. They plan to position Princess Stendo as the next heir to Domino. Nursi, in disbelief, dismisses everything as a joke. He cannot fathom Ukayo ruling Domino without the support of nobles like him. It becomes clear that Nursi is the true fool, uttering nonsense. The head of the Desia clan calls upon Shun to speak. Shun asserts that Nursi does nothing but argue all day and is of no help to the king. Shun is confident that if the people of Domino were allowed to dismiss Nursi's words, they would agree. The king, unable to disagree with Shun, orders his soldiers to remove Nursi. The corrupt Nursi is officially expelled. Sansui kneels before the king, expressing gratitude for his actions. The king approaches Shuzu and explains that Arcana's peace agreement was achieved without suffering casualty. Shuzu played a significant role in defending Caputo City. Additionally, the king praises Shun and Sega for performing their roles excellently. Sega feels the king's praise is just for show and can't compare to Sansui's. Sega is indeed a deep thinker, Ungekayo and Vajar question Sansui about being Suoboku's disciple. Sansui admits to being Suoboku's disciple. The two girls are shocked and suggest that Sansui should die, unable to believe that Suiboku actually took a disciple. Ungekayo and Vajar's reaction is intense, even wanting Pandora to take action against Sansui. Ukayo, hearing the name Suiboku for the first time, becomes curious. Exilier and all four divine weapons are aware of Suiboku who was once the owner of Exax. Dasenslaif explains that Suiboku's power is comparable to that of the gods. If Suiboku ever gets angry, both the kingdoms of Arcana and Domino will be reduced to mere names. Ukayo decides to take responsibility for the aftermath at the Deep Pit, where soldiers died due to his rash decision. The king, yet to witness Shuzu's power, is curious. With Palette's permission, Shuzu creates a fireball as large as the one he previously conjured and launches it into the sky. It appears that Shuzu's fireball hits a ship, causing it to fall into the area of the pit. As the ship crashes down, a woman and a young boy emerge. The woman is Kesu Danua, one of the eight saints, and the boy is Hakabu Noah. Danua, noticing Exax's presence, loudly scolds Exax for conspiring with some beast to attack them. Noah bursts into tears, blaming everything on Suiboku. Sansui is baffled by Suiboku's past actions that have led everyone to want him dead. Exilier clarifies that it was all an accident, not Suiboku's doing. Shuzu apologizes, relieved that there were no casualties, otherwise he would have been remorseful for life. Danua and Noah are surprised to see all the influential figures gathered at Caputo. The king recognizes Danua and Noah as the suppliers of food to Arcana, traveling by their flying ship. Exilier speaks up, explaining that Domino is facing a famine, and seeing the major suppliers here, he seeks their assistance. Dasenslaif, Vajar and Ungekayo are so embarrassed that they wish they could hide in a hole. Danua immediately agrees to help Domino. Thus, the kingdom of Arcana is now under the influence of the eight saints. 
Danua, controlling the food production, will focus on Domino. Noah stays with the Caputo family. Sansui is surprised to learn that Arcana has all members of the Eight Saints. This of course does not shake the peace agreement between nations. Sansui also gains more insight into Suiboku's past. Brower reunites Rain with Sansui, and she is overjoyed that everything has finally settled. The war has ended peacefully, with most power holders returning to their homes. In the carriage, Pandora yawns and expresses disbelief that both Noah and Danua are in Arcana. Pandora starts comparing, noting that these two mere tools roam freely without being bound by any authority. Akril thinks that having all the eight saints in one place is a rare sight. Shun believes this is an omen of an impending disaster. Akril turns to her grandfather, the head of the Dicea clan, cheerfully stating that if something does happen, they will have to rely on him again. Elder Dicea just sighs, knowing he will be busy again soon.